Afghanistan is a country sitting at the crossroads of both Central and South Asia and East and West. Afghanistan has an incredibly rich and interesting history, although in the West it has become somewhat synonymous with conflict since the 2001 American invasion of the country. The fact that it occurred despite that Afghanistan's nickname is the Graveyard of Empires is an excellent case and point as to the importance of studying history. The recent terms of the treaty that this video is going to cover makes it seem likely that the Americans will soon be added to that list. And that's not to make light of this conflict in any way. Since its start in 2001, over 4,000 American and coalition troops have perished, which pales in comparison to the 62,000 Afghan National Security Forces which have died, as well as over 30,000 civilians and many more of their Taliban adversaries. However, in 2021, there is news of peace in Afghanistan, a possible peace settlement that is being negotiated with the Taliban, the adversaries of the United States and their allies within the country, as they appear to be stronger than ever. And in this video, I want to look at how is this the case? What has happened beforehand and why is this peace treaty that's being proposed so controversial? For most Americans, this story starts on a single date, which is September the 11th, 2001 when the United States came under attack from the deadliest terror attack it has ever seen in what became known as 9-11, with the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, as well as several other attempted attacks. It was done by an Islamic extremist group called Al-Qaeda, which had launched the operations from Afghanistan under their leader Osama bin Laden. He had found shelter in Afghanistan, and that's why the United States Army invaded that country because they wanted to get back at the people responsible for causing all those deaths. However, they were being sheltered by the de facto rulers of the country, the Taliban, and the reason they come about is thanks to an earlier conflict with another superpower, this time the USSR in the Soviet-Afghan War, which started in 1979 when the USSR invaded Afghanistan to help the fledgling communist dictatorship there. Very soon, however, the Soviets realized that this was a war that would not be won easily or quickly. And as losses started to mount, they realized just how formidable their Mujahideen opponents were. These were often rural groups of fighters that fought against the Soviets using hit and run tactics and guerrilla attacks in very much the same way that the Taliban would do against the United States and coalition forces even today. With a crumbling economy, the Soviets pulled out in 1989, which didn't lead to peace in Afghanistan, but actually led to the first Afghan civil war as the communist regime held to power. By 1992, however, the Mujahideen had successfully captured the capital Kabul, but instead of peace arriving at this point, the second Afghan civil war kicked off when all of these various groups turned their weapons on each other and chaos reigned in Afghanistan. While this was still going on, it's in 1996 that a new player would enter the scene, and these were the Taliban. A clue as to their origin can be found in their name. Taliban is the Pashto word for students. And their origin lies back in the Soviet period in Afghanistan. When Soviet soldiers were combing the countryside looking for the Mujahideen, they did what counter-insurgency groups often do, which is a mass movement of people into urban centers which they could control. However, this soon led to overcrowding and many of the civilians, especially the women and the children as the men were fighting alongside the Mujahideen, actually went over the border to Pakistan, a fellow Pashto, largely Pashto Muslim country that took them in. However, conditions were really bad in these refugee camps and so many of these children went and sought a better life in the madrasa and these are the religious schools that were run by often extremely fundamentalist teachers and and clerics of Islam who on top of teaching them religious things also taught them how to maneuver in combat and taught them to fire weapons as a kind of defense force that they could use in case Pakistan would be next on the list of places the Soviets might invade. And this is where the ISI got involved. This is the inter-services intelligence in Pakistan, who at that time had received a lot of money from the United States of all people, who at this point saw actually this extreme militant Islam as a way of countering the Soviets in the Cold War and so inadvertently gave arms and training 
to the people who would cause such a headache for them a few decades down the line. From early 1990s, this Taliban group was becoming increasingly large and well-trained and organized and started infiltrating across the border into the southern Kandahar province of Afghanistan and making ready to make its final move, which it did in 1996 and swept away the rest of the Mujahideen's opposition and imposed their own Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which became an official state, even though it was only recognized by a few also extremely hardline Muslim countries around the world, such as Saudi Arabia. It should be noted that the old regime survived in the northern 10% of the country and would later come back as the Northern Alliance. But the rest of the 90% was subject to a very strict Hanafi-influenced version of Islamic Sharia law. And so there were things like the abolishment of anything considered haram and incredibly brutal forms of the actual punishment, such as cutting off hands and limbs for theft, as well as stonings to death and other forms of execution based on this literalist interpretation of the Quran. It now came to a head that this is why groups like Al-Qaeda really liked the idea of Afghanistan because it fit in with their extreme interpretation of Islam as well and that's why they were able to find safe haven there to launch their 2001 attacks and is also why the United States invaded Afghanistan to take over these bases that Al-Qaeda had started there. Now their actual invasion went very very well and they were able to defeat the Taliban on the ground and in the air very quickly with the help of the Northern Alliance and soon the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan was gone and it was replaced by a more democratic state as well as the Afghan National Army that was to take over the policing and defense of the country after the successful mission against the Taliban. However, they did return as an insurgency and so the war continued this was despite the fact that there was good, strong presence in the cities of Afghanistan, that it had nominally been taken over after a successful invasion. However, there never really was that much control over rural areas, as the Taliban knew it far better than the foreign forces that were there, and they had a far stronger presence in these regions where the Americans and other coalition forces found it very difficult to track them down and to persuade the local population that they could keep them safe from the Taliban and weren't just the latest wave of foreign invaders. Several presidents after Bush wrestled with the issue of Afghanistan. Barack Obama, for example, decided to increase the number of troops in 2011 to the peak at 140,000 Americans in the country, although this didn't seem to get many results and they promised then that by 2014 they would be decreasing the amount of troops there. This is also the year in which the British would hand over the last of their bases to the Afghan National Army they having provided the second largest number of troops in the country and was a significant withdrawal. Trump, on the other hand, also pursued a different kind of strategy, which was initially to pump more troops into the country. It's possible this was quite a savvy move, as in 2019, this forced the Taliban to the negotiating table, who wanted to negotiate to bring back down the number of US forces in the country although the Trump administration stopped these talks after the Taliban committed a large attack in the same year when they promised to dial down on them. However, in 2020, with attacks mounting, they renegotiated a negotiation together and sat down in the country of Qatar to work out a way forward of a US exit plan. This may seem a little odd at first because it suggests the United States and the Taliban both have the same end goal in mind, and to a certain degree this is true. They both want to withdraw United States forces from the country. Although how exactly that happens and what the Taliban will concede for this is the matter of great debate in these discussions and is part of what has caused such a large controversy as well as other factors. Part of this deal would indeed see that United States forces as well as other international coalition forces would leave the country by May of 2021. This is why this has come to the fore now. On top of this, it would happen within 14 months and that time is running out. But on top of this, the 
and United States would also ensure that 5,000 Taliban prisoners would be released. In exchange, the Taliban would release 1,000 Afghan national security forces of the, in their prisons themselves, as well as completely disavowing and breaking off all ties with Al-Qaeda, which, remember, was actually the main reason that the United States got involved in Afghanistan in the first place. As well, they would promise to stop their attacks against United States and coalition forces within the country, which they have done. Since this time, there have been no United States or coalition forces deaths inside the country, at least. The Afghan government, and especially the president, Ashraf Ghani, has been incredibly critical of this deal for several reasons. First and foremost is the fact that this deal was done in Qatar between the United States and the Taliban without the Afghan government having even been invited to speak. Furthermore, while the Taliban promised to stop some of the violence, at least in the country, this has not been the case. And though it's true that from the time of the deals up until July and even to this day, no more American or international coalition forces have been killed, Taliban attacks increased 70% in the country. And this led to the deaths of between February and July, 3,560 Afghan National Army and police forces at the hands of the Taliban, which is a large increase from the periods before. Furthermore, there is no indication that the Taliban have actually cut off their links with Al-Qaeda, which was such an important point for the United States. And actually, the Afghan National Army and intelligence forces have some quite compelling evidence that shows that there has been no such secession of communication and contact between them and that they are still very much embedded with one another. Furthermore, the question of the prisoner exchange has been incredibly hotly debated within the Afghan parliament and the government response to this. Part of this lies in that the United States promised to release 5,000 Taliban prisoners. This should also tell you something in the numbers involved, that they were promising to release 5,000 of the Taliban prisoners for just 1,000 of the Afghan National Army prisoners held by the Taliban, which shows you something of the power dynamic between the two. The issue for the Afghan government, however, was that the United States had promised this at a talk that the Afghan government was not represented at. And actually, they say that because they are Afghan prisons, this is an issue for the Afghan government and not for the United States to be promising to the Taliban. And this caused a real crisis because actually they had released something like 4,500 prisoners. But the last 500 prisoners the Taliban wanted released had been so bloodthirsty and so dangerous in the country that the government really had a crisis deciding whether or not they would, which in the end they did to hold on to this peace agreement. This makes things really uncertain for the future of Afghanistan with the United States promising to pull out and continuing with this peace deal despite the fact that the Taliban seem to be breaking every of the promised points that they had discussed with the United States as shown above. The Afghan National Army are increasingly losing ground to the Taliban and just in December of 2020 they abandoned 193 army checkpoints in the southern province of Kandahar which has long been a Taliban stronghold and just simply abandoned them all to the Taliban who have taken over the ground. Now in 2021 things don't seem to be looking much better. There is a possibility that the new president of the United States, Joe Biden, might do something differently in Afghanistan and change Trump's exit strategy. But thus far, there is no indication of this whatsoever. And it seems that he is following the same exit strategy as Trump proposed, which is that there are now just 2,500 American soldiers in Afghanistan, which is the lowest level it's been since 2001 and the invasion, and which has been widely criticized by both American and Afghan military experts for not being anywhere near enough the number that's needed to keep the Taliban at bay, which is why they're making such gains against the Afghan army at the moment. Interestingly enough, the Germans have decided to increase their troop levels in Afghanistan to around 1,300, although these, like the Americans, are largely in an advisory capacity, and it seems very unlikely that with the rest of the American withdrawal going on, there will be any European troops that are left there either. It's true that at the moment, around 52% of Afghanistan is under the control of the Taliban, 
and not the actual government. And this is incredibly worrying when you think about the trends of what actually happened during the Soviet pullout and how quickly that led to the chaos that then eventually would lead to the United States invasion. And it seems that history is somewhat repeating itself in this sense. Just this month, which at the time of recording is March 2021, the president Ashraf Ghani has said that his government is for the first time willing to enter peace negotiations with the Taliban that may offer them a share in government. Just about two weeks ago, the Almad district fell completely to the Taliban, and it's thought that around only 40% of the police stations are still functioning inside the country, according to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. It's hoped now by the Afghan government that what might lead to a lasting peace solution is that the Taliban may be incorporated into the political process and that they will then slowly demilitarize and become part of normal Afghan society again using words rather than bullets as a means of bringing forth their political end goal. Although this seems somewhat unlikely, this is exactly what happened with the mainstream Irish Republican army during the Troubles, where figures like Martin McGuinness and um, Gerry Adams also became integrated into the political system in the political party of Sinn Féin, and this helped to greatly reduce the violence there. However, it seems like a far-off dream when considering the very violent state of Afghanistan at the moment. There's also the interesting question of with the United States imminent to pull out of the country, what will happen and who will fill the shoes if Afghanistan does indeed continue on this path? There are many regional players that are getting involved, not least Pakistan, who of course had these close ties with the Taliban and elements of which it maintained, while the country itself has been a large investor into neighbouring Afghanistan being largely Pashtun, just like Afghanistan itself. India, on the other hand, of course, is a large rival to Pakistan, but has invested billions into the country of Afghanistan, and as well as with military assistance and infrastructural support. And it seems likely that India actually is going to play more of a role in potentially peacekeeping as well as the peace negotiations, as New Delhi has been involved at several of these large conferences hosted by the United States with the question of what's going to happen in Afghanistan. And if you're interested in that, actually, I've been thinking about making a video on the Indian involvement there and what their role might be in the future. So comment below if you would like to see that. Until further afield, the powers of Russia and China are also involved. Russia appears to have played somewhat a proxy war in a very interesting parallel repeat of history in the country given their Soviet past and the American involvement helping the Mujahideen by somewhat helping the Taliban against the Americans, although the precise details aren't exactly clear. China, on the other hand, is quite a lot closer than Russia and has actually built a military base in one of the regions that borders Afghanistan and Tajikistan, as well as, of course, having donated billions to Afghanistan as that would be an important important part of its Belt and Road initiative, which makes it likely that China will be more involved in the future, as well as wanting to safeguard some of the new contracts in mining it has been signing in Kabul at the time. So it's quite possible that China and Russia may be playing an important part, as well as, of course, the Islamic powers of Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shia Iran, as there are both Sunnis and Shias within Afghanistan. Iran is also known to have played somewhat of a proxy war there, whereas the Saudis will see it as an important area to keep stable and from falling under the influence of Iran as these two powers are vying for control in several hotspots in the Middle East. And should the Afghan government fall and Afghanistan come up for grabs once again, so to speak, it may become another of these hotspots in this Middle Eastern conflict between these two Islamic powers. Afghanistan's future then seems incredibly uncertain. It's not sure whether these peace talks with the United States are actually peace talks or are actually a front for the United States to pull out as quickly as possible and that then Afghanistan will go the way of Vietnam or Afghanistan during the Afghan-Soviet war. It's not exactly sure what is going to happen. I hope for the people of Afghanistan that this peace deal will actually lead to peace, but if history is any indicator, it doesn't seem like this is likely. Unless Joe Biden radically changes the exit strategy and the plan of the number of troops in Afghanistan, or whether another of the countries I've just mentioned fills the shoes of a peacekeeping force, which also seems unlikely given the track record of fighting war in Afghanistan, it seems like war may be a reality for the people there for quite a bit longer. 
So that's a little bit of the background on this new peace settlement that's being hammered out in Afghanistan at the moment, or I, I should say the peace settlement that was between the United States and uh, members of the Taliban that were happening in Qatar and that are now coming to fruition with the last withdrawals of the United States troops there for the first time since, of course, the invasion in 2001. It's a very interesting topic. There's an awful lot to it. And I think this is one of those momentous moments in history with the pulling out of these forces. Please let me know what you think in the comments below, because this is just my interpretation of the events as I had them presented to me by various news outlets, as well as doing some digging by myself. But any information is more than welcome. As long as it's all respectful and polite in the comments below, then that's all great. Do let me know if you'd like to see that video on the Indian involvement or possible involvement in the future as they seem to be becoming more involved there. As well as any other videos that are related to this, I'm going to have more on the history of Afghanistan as well as a collaboration with another really cool channel. Hikma History will be linked below because he also makes videos on history and has some stuff about Afghanistan already. But in a future video of mine looking at another topic related to this, I'll be doing a collab with him. So plenty more to come on similar topics as well as weekly videos trying to cover some of the more modern events and the history behind them, as well as some classic history that will be up soon. Anyway, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History.